Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, just as a, a point of clarification, um, I work in Dubai, a very lovely city and a lovely country, UAE, but I come from uh, Egypt, Alexandria. So uh, just for a, a slight clarification. So um, uh, let me just get this correct scene. Um, yeah, I think, I hope you all see my screen now. So for the, this important first session, it's related to the joint American Diabetes Association and the European Association for Study of Diabetes Consensus on Management of Diabetes. Um, and uh, specifically, I would cover the first part on the hyperglycemia section. So um, when we look into um, this important document, first we have to understand it's a consensus report. It's a very comprehensive consensus report with, with nearly 350 references where the authors have gone thoroughly through the processes and came to this consensus report. But at the end of the day, it's not a protocol, it's not a guideline, and we can certainly look into areas that maybe for our own clinical experience or um, environment, we might vary. We will not vary in the focus, surely anywhere in the globe, that we have to think of these crucial four points. Glycemic management, cardiorenal protection with glucose-lowering agents, weight management, and cardiovascular risk factors management. These nowadays are very important points. And of course, the glycemic management is a very important one. I'm delighted that in the narrative of their presentation, they started with glycemic control. The reason I see this is crucial, slight diversion, um, because in our Eastern cultures, we have many people with diabetes in early age. And consequently, cardiovascular and renal problems perhaps happen a bit later in their life. But glycemic control is a crucial factor, as we know from DCCT and from UKPDS, a crucial factor for all diabetes-related complications, specifically for the vital muscular complications. And of course, with strong hints for macrovascular uh, complications as well. And with this, they stress upon the importance of thinking of behavioral approaches, metabolic surgery, as well as medication in the glycemic management, and not just to focus on one of these aspects. They stress upon the weight issue, which I'm sure in our communities is really quite important. And they're not talking here about any weight reduction, they're talking about a minimum of 5%, with a stress upon 10 to 15%, would really could lead to even remission of diabetes as well as extra benefit beyond the glycemic management, specifically for the cardiometabolic disease and for quality of life. So with having the person with diabetes at the center of care, we need to think in any person with us with diabetes on these key aspects to assess the characteristics of the individual, consider specific factors, utilize the shared care decision, and agree a management plan, and implement the plan to eventually have a monitoring process and review this plan on a regular basis as well. So when you think of diabetes, the top priority is self-management, education, and support. This is crucial, and we have to embrace diabetes self-management management, uh, education and support as being a crucial part of the diabetes care as much as pharmacotherapy. And obviously we have to identify and know how to access these resources. Unfortunately, in many of our communities, this is one of the key areas that is lacking. And of course, we have to make the person with diabetes understand the importance of this and getting a holistic approach for the, all the aspects together. And initiate the self-management and, and update it and renew it on a regular basis according to the person, social as well as medical aspects and life support. They also stress upon an important point that 
is unfortunate reality in many cases, which is clinicians' inertia. We end up with giving soft excuses, overestimation of the care provided, and we do not provide enough education, training, or practice organization to overcome these issues. So weight management, when it comes in the guidelines, is because we now have available therapy in the format of GLP-1 receptor agonists, as well as the combination of GLP-GIP um, that can reduce the weight of a person with diabetes in the studies that were done by a, a figure that is equivalent to what we see sometimes in metabolic surgery. We are talking here about 13% of the body weight of the individual reaching over 12 kilograms of the person weight. Of course, we, this is important to think of because bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery has been shown for up to 10 years to reduce the weight loss of the individual up to 30%. While medical therapy was not able in the past to sustain weight loss, and we see in many cases, people achieve a target and then they bound back to where they started. But with metabolic surgery, the situation is different. Having said that, the available therapy now, as I mentioned, has been very important. But before we think of therapy for weight management, they have stressed upon, we need first to set realistic targets and goals, and then provide the person, not just with, you need to lose weight, or you need to change your diet, or you need to do physical activity. We need to provide them with evidence-based, structured weight management programs. And this is really quite important. Now, failing this or not achieving the goals, then we need to think of the added option of the pharmacotherapy or the metabolic surgery. And when we choose a drug for glycemic control, we need to choose a drug that also have a dual effect of not just the glycemic control, but weight efficacy that is crucial for this. And with this, they step out to spell what is the difference between what physical activity I can do while I'm sitting or stepping or the quality of the exercise to make me sweat or even strengthening the muscles exercise to the type of exercise. I don't have the time to go through all of these aspects, but they are very important and I advise all the colleagues to read them in depth. They also talk about sleep time. Sleep time, sleep quality, and the timing of the sleep. Nowadays, we see in many cultures, people are going to bed very late at night and sleep and, and waking up late. And they've looked into the sleep pattern, which is better and certainly the classic early sleep and early rise is far much better for your health. So when it comes to the glycemic management of people with type 2 diabetes, we now have this beautiful renewed algorithm. The right-hand side of it is related to the weight management, which I've already discussed with you, but the left-hand side is talking about glycemic improvement. I'll go back to this because it has classified the type of agent that we use and talked even about combination therapy to start with and not necessarily metformin for all. Metformin traditionally is the recommended first-line glucose lowering therapy because of its high efficacy because in lowering H1C, because of its rare hypoglycemia, and of course, because of its potential for some modest weight loss and perfect safety and very, very cost effectiveness. And they look obviously for every drug on their impact on the kidney and on the heart and with all of this, we do not have anything negative about metformin. So certainly it's one of the important drugs. For sulfonylurea, there's been an, an important shift in recognition that not all sulfonylureas are the same, that they are highly efficacious when it comes to glucose lowering, they are inexpensive and accessible to many, and they are not all the same. They are not a heterogeneous group, and hence we need to think of the more modern saponiaria, 
with lower link with lower risk of hypoglycemia or impact on weight, especially knowing that they are neutral when it comes to impact on heart or kidney. So TZDs have been, in my opinion, massively ignored as an important tool, specifically for our cultures where the phenotype of so many of our people with diabetes includes significant insulin resistance. And that's why they have stressed upon here the importance of the high efficacy of TZDs, the fact that they have no hypoglycemia, and the potential benefit on the cardiac, as well as, of course, the effect on NASH. There is weight gain as a side effect and fluid retention, and hence optimizing the, 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 the therapy by maybe utilizing a smaller dose or the combination with other drugs such as SGL2 would minimize these issues. DP4 inhibitors have been with us for some time and they stress upon the benefits of being intermediate in efficacy with no hypoglycemia, neutral on weight and neutral on other cardiovascular or renal risks. And the early combination that's been shown with some of the earlier studies, specifically with the study of the, the liptin, has changed people's mind in the stepwise approach to change from monotherapy to perhaps dual therapy when required. SGL2 inhibitors would be covered thoroughly the, the, uh, as well as GLP-1 in the cardiovascular aspects, but we all know about this newcomer, about their efficacy that ranges from intermediate to high, about the lack of hypoglycemia, the weight loss, and the extensive studies on benefit for cardiovascular or renal outcome. GLP-1s are... Alert from low battery. I'm sorry, let me just um, fix my battery for my presentation. Um, I think that's fixed now. Um, so GLP-1s, of course, they have a high level of efficacy with low hypos and weight loss and with evidence of benefit for the cardiovascular um, aspect as well as um, for renal aspects as well. Now we have oral, we have, we have injectable, and cost, of course, is an issue in many of our communities, but we should not ignore such an important class of drugs as we have a sizable proportion of people who could benefit from this. There's a new options, as I mentioned, that there is oral similar type, and there is the higher doses of GLP-1s in some studies with benefits such as dulaglutide higher dose and higher doses of semaglutide showing benefits on both glycemic efficacy and weight management to a level that we have not seen with the traditional doses. But we also have the newcomer that is available for us in UAE here, as well as for the USA of the combination of the GLP-1 with the GIP trizipatide with very high levels of reduction of glycemic, um, hyperglycemia, as well as weight reduction. So we now have a much bigger options for treatment. And this single peptide has been remarkable from the point of efficacy for glycemia, as well as for weight with no uh, um, risk of hypoglycemia or rare risk of hypoglycemia. The ongoing studies for cardiovascular trials hopefully are going to show us um, results in the near future so that we can judge their safety on cardiac and renal aspects. Of course, insulin is a crucial tool for us because insulin is the only drug in our um, um, arsenal of, of choices that has no limit to glycemic lowering. Um, we know, of course, that insulin has moved thoroughly from the days that it was simple insulin to now the most sophisticated molecule that has lower levels of hypoglycemia compared to the past and lower levels of weight gain compared to the past. However, these two points are still important points to be careful with when we initiate or intensify insulin therapy. Insulin is neutral when it comes to cardiorenal profile, and that's important as well to remember. 
the guidelines, the recent consensus rather than guidelines, stress upon the importance of considering combination therapy. Why? To increase durability of glycemic effect, potential to address the therapeutic inertia, the simultaneous targeting of multiple pathophysiological processes characterized by the type of type 2 diabetes, the potential impact on medication burden, adherence, and treatment resistance, and of course, the complementary clinical benefits of the different classes of drugs that could be combined in a single tablet or in, when you combine with your patient. So again, they stress upon here the importance of thinking of efficacy, and they have stressed upon we have drugs with very high efficacy, such as dulaglutide, high dose, semaglutide, terzipatide, or insulin. Indeed, um, among this is the oral combination or the combination of a GLP-1 with insulin. Following that, there are drugs with the high efficacy, which are the GLP-1s not listed above, metformin, SGL-2, sulfonylurea, and TZDs, and the intermediate efficacy of the DP4 inhibitors. When it comes to insulin initiation, they of course say, consider a GLP-1 first. But if you already started your patient on a GLP-1 or it's not feasible to do so, then consider basal insulin and then um, add a mealtime in other types of insulin if required. I do not necessarily agree with this approach. I feel we need to personalize the insulin based on the profile of the individual. Sometimes you will start a basal, sometimes you will start a different type of insulin according to the individual profile, um, lifestyle, and other aspects. Again, the integrated management is crucial with the multidisciplinary approach. This is a team approach and cannot be done just with a clinician and the importance of the language that we use by language, I, not, I don't mean English or Hindi or Arabic, I mean the wording and the communication with our people with diabetes so that it's simple and understandable by all. I have finished here, I would like to finish with this interesting photo which I took when I was working in UK, because I was surprised to find that in some of the parts of South, e of South England, there is a sign towards Egypt. So it looks like you can reach Egypt so many ways even driving through England. Thank you all, and I look forward to the questions and answers at the end.